whole cover-up from the very beginning. They have the, one of the finest national security intelligence operations on the planet. I mean, a retired Soviet KBG general by the name of Oleg Kalugin, who is now living in Washington, D.C., and he's an advisor and <laughs> some of our people in government. Oleg Kalugin said, he said, if we had had the intelligence operations in the Soviet Union as good as the one at the Vatican, the Cold War would still be going on. The Berlin Wall would have not fallen and the Soviet Union would still exist. He says, we always knew that the best damn security intelligence operation on the planet was out of the Vatican. And probably the reason is that every damn priest in every country on the planet, Catholic priest, is, is in a sense an agent of the Vatican Intelligence Secret Service. And they're uh, deeply concerned about the location and the appearance in our solar system of a planet known as Nibiru which has already been photographed, and I have a picture of it here in a moment to share with you. The tenth planet has been photographed by uh, an astro, what do they call them, where the telescopes are? Well, anyhow, they've taken pictures of the damn thing in southern Chile, because it's, it has appeared below the ecliptic in the southern hemisphere. It's already been photographed by at least three cameras and telescopes. It's one of the biggest secrets in our government today. The reality and the presence of the 10th planet. Our government has known about it since 1980. Anyhow, it's real, it's there, and we're going to see it up here. I've been involved in this whole thing for 40 years, and I've been deeply involved in it for the last 20. And let me tell you, take it for what it's worth, in my view, there ain't gonna be no disclosure. Not like they expect. They expect the government to someday have a news conference and stand up and say, hey, we got a little surprise for you. Guess what? We've been keeping it from you, we're sorry about that, but, uh, it was for your own good, you know. You guys weren't ready for this. You probably couldn't handle it. So, but now we're gonna tell you. Oh yes, uh, aliens are here. They've been here for quite a while. Well, they're all over the place. Well, they are indeed all over the damn place. But you're not gonna get a government disclosure because that's not how government works. First of all, they're a bunch of nitwits in some cases, they're not capable of giving you a disclosure and doing it in a sensible, thoughtful, caring way. For a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is that they don't want to admit to you they've been lying to you for over 60 years. And then the other thing is that they are really a little bit uncertain and frightened themselves because the true scope of their awareness and what they know still has them in a state of shock. An event took place in California in 1954 at an Air Force base known as Murak. This event had been planned and orchestrated <clears throat> by sensitive military, primarily naval, individuals and what it was essentially is that Eisenhower got aboard his plane went out to this Murak Air Force Base with a whole passel of guys from his administration and including the Archbishop or Cardinal or Bishop of Los Angeles a guy by the name of McIntyre and this thing had been orchestrated and organized for some time because there had been communications between individuals in naval intelligence. And I say naval, and I say this again and again and again. My kid retired as a senior officer from the Navy just in November. 
The Navy has been up to here this whole program from the very beginning, and they actually run the operation over at Groom Lake at this fort. Anyhow, this event took place. Uh, I've had verification and proof that it actually transpired from sources impeccable. They flew Ike out there. Supposedly, he was visiting a dentist. He had a problem. Well, bless his heart, he really did have a problem, and this is over. He ended up having a coronary. That impact upon him was so powerful that he ended up having a heart attack. Anyhow, what transpired in April of 1954? A group of others, I hate the word alien. I don't even like the word ETs. But whatever term you care to use, they came in. There were three ships. They were golden in color. They were discs, primarily, circular discs, but they were fat discs. They had a, a high dome on the top and they had a big dome on the bottom. And these golden metallic discs came in, three of them, and they circled over the runway several passes and Ike and this whole crowd are standing there with you know, mouths dropping open. We had some generals, we had some admirals, and we had a couple of church authorities there and poor old Ike. And these guys circled around for a time and then one of the ships came in and landed on the tarmac right in front of the hangar where the receiving party, the welcoming party, was located. And they had cameras set up. There were at least four, maybe five cameras. Everything was on film. All of the sounds, they picked up every word that was said. One of the ships come over and lands right in front of the hangar. The other two ships stayed hovering over the runway during the entire process. The stories I've heard from people I trust in that the whole thing went three days. There was a lot of exchange. And your country hasn't been the same since. You talk about black government, shadow government. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, you have no idea how damn black it is. The government you think you've got is not the government you've got. The government you think you had, the government that Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Hamilton, all the rest of those guys created 200 years ago is not the government you've got today. You do not have a democratic republic with people, and I'm sorry to have to tell you that. You all know about Roswell. Well, let me tell you, Roswell was one little tiny event. For God's sake, there were three crashes in that area in New Mexico within 30 days. Roswell was only a tiny piece of it. There have been crashes going on all over the country and all around the world for the last 40 years, 60 years. We've been picking up bits and pieces of hardware all over the damn planet. The Navy retrieved a UFO out of the waters off San Diego in 1941. And if you talk about parts, well, we picked up bits and pieces. Ooh, we loaded them up. We took them off here and we took them off there. We took them at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We've taken them at several places. And then, God bless them, we've taken the bodies and a couple of survivors off as well. Well, that's ancient history. But I'm saying, forgive me if I repeat myself, your, your, your government that you thought you had ceased to exist in 1947. And 1947 was also a year where we created the Central Intelligence Agency, we created the National Security Organization, and we also signed a pact called the UKUSA Pact, UK-USA. <clears throat> now this pact we signed in 1947 was not just an accident. At the end of World War II, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States signed this pact, and we have been like this ever since. But the people in 
the United Kingdom, in England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland. They don't know any more about it in, in reality than most people out there do. Because one of the things about the Yucusa Pact was the lid came down on all the secrets, particularly the secrets of their reality, and it's, the lid has been down ever since. <clears throat> I have to laugh sometimes when I uh, hear Nick Pope speaking out. And many of you know who Nick Pope is. He's a delightful young man. He's a bright young man. He uh, worked for the uh, Ministry of Defense in Britain for a number of years. And he had the UFO desk. And Nick is a lot like some of our people. They sit at the desk and they see a little bit, but they don't see most of it, because most of it never got to Nick's desk. So when he tells you that everything's been released, <clears throat> we're releasing it all over the place. Oh yeah, France has been releasing their classified material, the United Kingdom has been releasing their classified material, and the U.S. has begun releasing little bits and pieces of it. If you think they're releasing anything of real importance, forget it. The stuff that they're releasing is garbage. <clears throat> Nick, forgive me, wherever you are at this moment, I'm not putting you down. Most of the stuff they're releasing is garbage. The only bit of information that came out of France recently that was of any information or of any value was a report they called the Cometa Report. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that. A number of retired French admirals and generals and scientists got together and put together a 30 or 40 page document called the Cometa Report about what they considered to be the reality of the, uh, the extraterrestrial presence, which is a term I like to repeat from time to time, uh, the UFO matter. And the Cometa report said essentially that, damn it, we're not being told the truth and we think it's time for everybody to fess up and get this information out. And the French were really ticked because, you know, they, they've had a shit chip on their shoulder from the very beginning that they've never really been shared with by the United Kingdom and the United States. <clears throat> so Washington was not sending anything to shape headquarters about the UFO matter where these things were flying all over Central Europe back then. Gordon Cooper admitted to me, he said, you know, I was flying jet fighters over Europe in the 50s, and they were all over the damn place. We wondered then what they were all about. Well, bless his heart, Gordon now knows the answer. Oh, where were we? I was rambling, excuse me. We were talking about disclosure. There are lots of different things that have been happening some of this material here. One of the things that ticked me off the most is a little document known as Executive Order. I have in my fingers, I sound like one of those guys on TV, I have in my greasy fingers here an Executive Order, a copy of it. This was signed by Slick Willie, oh, excuse me, President Clinton. Slick, Slick Willie signed this on September the 29th, 1995. An executive order is something that you may not be aware of. An executive order is probably the most powerful piece of paper there is in our government. A president sits down, comes up with an idea, and he has something he wants to do. He puts it on paper, he signs it, that becomes law. Nobody in Congress has to talk about it. Nobody in Congress is asked to see it. Nobody in Congress has to give approval to this. Because when the president signs it, it becomes law. Now that in itself, good God, Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, those guys are spinning in their graves, I think. The fact that we've reached this point where an imperial president can sit in his office at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and sign an executive order which becomes the law of the land and you cannot argue with it. This particular one that's 
Clinton signed in September of 95, wiped away every rule in the Environmental Protection Act. There were a bunch of guys over here, not too far away, at Groom Lake, Site 51, who were dying horrible deaths because they had been exposed to something, smoke, chemical, whatever, during, the, during their job. And these guys, the flesh was falling off their bodies, their skin was rupturing, the flesh was falling. They were in incredible pain, and they were dying. And their doctors and some attorneys tried to find out what it was that was causing this. If the doctors could find out what was causing it, they could possibly help those guys deal with this and they could come up with some way of treating them. Well, not only did the government deny the request for information on what that material was that was killing these guys, those bastards in Washington even denied the damn facility didn't even exist. And this is after the Soviets had taken photographs from orbit proving the existence of Groom Lake and Site 51. And the Soviets were good enough to let us have photographs of the damn place. And yet your government in Washington says, oh, that, that doesn't exist, that place, that place doesn't exist. And they wouldn't share any information, and those guys continued to die. I don't know how many of them passed away. I lost track of it over the years. Let me tell you one other small thing. A retired scientist by the name of David Froning, who is alive and well and living outside of Flagstaff, Arizona today. Fifteen years ago, David Froning spoke at a conference, which I was part of. And Froning graduated or completed his, his career working for Lockheed Martin, this vast, this vast corporation that's, that's got their sticky fingers in so damn many things. David told us at this conference, 15 years ago, that before he retired, <clears throat> Lockheed Martin had, I don't know how the word he is, they had developed and were using hyperluminal flight. And it took some of us a little bit of a side there, and I, you know, David, hyperluminal flight. Yeah, he said, faster than light. They've had it 40 years. Who has it? Well, he says, I want to say you, your government, but I can't say that with all honesty because he says it's, it's classified. We've had hyperluminal flight for years, and you may know about it in another 20, 30 years when they fess up and tell you that what they can do, and what they've accomplished, and what they can do, and what they have done. Now, another little tiny tidbit. This was from David Froning, a respected man, a, a scientist who spent all those years. Froning was involved with uh, what he called modified field propulsion, a variable field form of propulsion. They were dealing with matter-antimatter conversion. They called it exotic field tension. And he said, flat, it modifies time and space. And it ends up, we've got transluminal, luminal, hyperluminal light. Now, some years ago, a guy by the name of Ben Ritz retired from Lockheed Martin. And in the end of his career, Ben ran the skunk works over there at Lockheed. And there was a little jovial exchange between him and the guys in the audience out there. And Ben Rich said, you know, we can take E.T. home. I think the movie is 
The E.T. movie was out about that time. He says, we can take E.T. home. And a few of the guys in the audience says, Ben, what the hell are you talking about? Oh, he said, let me tell you, we've got stuff you wouldn't believe. We can take extraterrestrial home. So they said, look, what the hell is all of that? He goes over to the blackboard and he writes, unfunded opportunities. Okay. Well, the guys say, well, what the hell does that mean, Ben? Unfunded opportunities. So he goes over with the chalk and he circles the U and the F and the O. U, F, O. And then he had a big grin on his face and he left the podium. So we, we got these little bits and bits and pieces. And you talk about leakage. Arthur Clark, Clark used to say, if you see advanced technology to a degree that's beyond what you can understand, people consider it as magic. Well, this is magic, guys. This was photographed in the infrared, and this is a city under the surface of Mars the size of Chicago. It's generating an enormous amount of heat. I'm sorry about the details of it are not that clear, but you can see the streets, the streets, blocks. This is an underground city on Mars that's fully active and filled with God knows who and what. Next picture, please. That's Phobos. That's the moon, 12 miles in diameter. The Soviets planned to land on it. Well, someone else said, no, you're not going to do that. But that is a picture of Phobos which they've all concluded is an artificial satellite. Big secret, so's our own. Next picture. This photograph was taken by your own NASA Apollo 13 guys on their, <clears throat> on their trip to the moon that didn't work out too well. And many of you may have heard rumors about the story, but Apollo 13 <clears throat> had a small nuclear device aboard and they had been told by the guys that ran NASA that they were going to land on the surface going to place this small nuclear device and then when they all left and came back aboard and came back they were going to detonate it and study the reverberations of this nuclear device study the seismology of the moon because they've been convinced for some years that the moon is basically hollow it appears to be somewhat of an artificial satellite. Well, they plan to develop and detonate this nuclear device, and, and, and the others said, no, no, you're not going to do that. Uh, we'll get back to that picture again, please. All right. I wanted to show you. This picture was taken by Apollo 13. The object you see there in the middle <clears throat> is five miles long. It's an artificial, I assume metallic, object probably crammed with guys and that object followed our Apollo 13 all the way to the moon around and back. Now whether they were trying to make sure the Apollo 13 guys got home safely or what, whether they were the ones responsible for Apollo 13's little accident which kept them from landing on the moon and placing that nuclear device, who knows, we may find out someday. But here you have an artificial object in orbit on the way to the moon, five miles long. Now I've spent some time aboard aircraft carriers with my kid. I've been invited several times. My, my boy served on four different carriers, nuclear-powered Nemitz-class carriers. <clears throat> we have carriers with 5,000 men in the crew, 1,000 feet long, 150 aircraft, snack bars, dining rooms, accommodations, this and that. Can you imagine the accommodations on an object? I like to think that, you know, there's McDonald's, bowling alleys, God knows what. I'm sure they have a fairly good life out there. Anyhow, aboard an object five miles long, I've tried. <coughs> in the time I had to do two things. 
to impress upon you the reality of the extraterrestrial presence, the ones I refer to as the others. I hate the term alien, I hate the term UFO. There are no UFOs. We've known what they are for years and years and years. Some of them are ours, some of them are theirs. There are no unidentified flying objects out there. They're all identified. I've tried to impress upon you the seriousness of it, the seriousness of the cover-up and the lies they've been telling you. The importance of why you need to know as much as you can know. And you need to be presented with the material because then you all deserve the truth. You have a right to know and you have a need to know because you are the people that this whole damn thing is all about. Now, they're in our midst. <laughs> That's an understatement. When I came in, I arrived yesterday. I've been running around here all day. There's an old friend sitting in the audience out here who I've known for years. He's currently with Defense Intelligence Agency. He's getting up to years, probably going to retire very soon. And I've, sent, I've met him many times, we've shared a lot of information. There is another young man in the audience here who I will not point to, because I can't see the damn thing with those lights, who is from National Security Agency, and he and my old friend were not aware of the other one being present here. But the one that's most redeeming and most exciting for me is there is a couple here who look like they're in the mid-40s. They look like a husband and wife. <clears throat> nice looking people. Very nice, nicely appearance. As I said, their appearance is like a husband and wife. They're sitting together. Neither one of them were born on this planet. Guys, they're in your midst. You have dinner down here somewhere. You could, if you have dinner down here somewhere, you could be sitting next to one of them. There are two of them in the audience this afternoon, and I want to take salute you. They're nice folks. They're as human in the most respects as you and I are. They're all over the damn place. They're in our midst, and they are family. We're related to them because they were the ones that had a hand in establishing us as a hybrid race a hundred thousand years ago. And that hybridization is still underway, it's still happening, even as we sit here and speak. And it's simply this, you're not alone and you have never been alone. And you have had, as I have learned over the years, an intimate interrelationship with advanced extraterrestrial intelligence from the beginning of human history. But what the thing I've learned, I guess, the most powerful thing is that there is a God. Don't you ever doubt that? There is a supreme being. And you're all a part of that because there is a spark of that divinity flashing and burning in every one of you. It's known as your soul, your immortal soul. I want to say something in closing. I want to say, I want to try to communicate to you how much you people have meant to me over the years. I want you to know how much you all have meant to me over the years. Your support, your encouragement, and your warmth is only the one thing that's kept me going. I want you to know, I want you to know how grateful I am to each and every one of you. You are friends, Tiamo. I love you all. Good night.